To my YouTube listeners, if you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, please subscribe. It'll make a big difference for the Hasidic Story Project. This is the Hasidic Story Project with Barack Holman, podcasting from Jerusalem, Israel. This podcast is sponsored by listeners just like you. To become a supporter of this podcast, please go to HasidicStory.com. H-A-S-I-D-I-C Story.com. You'll never know. You'll never know. You'll never know. You'll never know. Around 150 years ago, a relative of Reb Shmuel of Lubavitch, the fourth Lubavitcher Rebbe, and one of the sons of the Tzemach Tzedek, had a relative that visited him from Eretz Yisrael, from the land of Israel. And the Rebbe was very excited to hear news of what's going on with the Jews in the Holy Land. And the Hasid, who lived in Jerusalem, he said to the Rebbe, You know, Rebbe, people say that the souls of the Jews that live in the land of Israel, and especially the holy city of Jerusalem, are very special and lofty. But to tell you the truth, Rebbe, I know many people that live in the Holy Land, and I don't think they're any different than the Jews here in Russia, for example. I don't get it. Why do people say that? And the Rebbe said to this Hasid, And how do you know who is a lofty and holy soul in the land of Israel? He said, let me tell you a story that I heard from my father, Reb Menachem Mendel, the Tzemach Tzedek, a blessed memory. And after you hear the story, tell me if you can still tell who is really holy in the Holy Land and who's not. He said, outside of Jerusalem, there's a small village, and there was a simple peasant who was a farmer. He didn't have much of a Jewish education. He never had a chance to learn Chumash, the Torah, or the Mishnah, the basis of the Talmud. And he didn't even understand the meaning of the daily prayers. And so as a result, he had memorized some prayers, he had memorized some Tehillim, but he wanted to daven the full service like everyone else. And the Siddur confused him. He didn't understand which prayers were supposed to be said during the weekday, what were the special prayers to be said on Monday and Thursday? What was different on Shabbos and Yom Tov? And sometimes the Yom Tovs were different and everything confused him. He didn't know what to do. So once a week, he would come into the holy city of Jerusalem to sell his fruits and vegetables. And there was a certain rabbi that would buy from him every week. And he would ask the rabbi questions and eventually the two of them became friends. And this became this simple Jew's rabbi. And so every week when the Jew would come into town, he would go to the rabbi's house and ask the rabbi to write down exactly the order of the prayers that were going to be said in the next week. Every day, exactly what needed to be said, which page and the page numbers, and the rabbi would write it down for him. And the rabbi thought many times, you know, it would be much simpler if I just explained to the simple Jew how the Siddur works, that the weekday prayers are basically all the same, except for what we say on Mondays and Thursdays. But he knew that this Jew was too simple to even understand that. And once he tried and he saw that the farmer didn't get it, so every week he had the patience to write down for the farmer exactly the prayers that needed to be said that week. And one time, the simple Jew, the farmer, he came into the holy city during the rainy month of Cheshvan, which is the month that we're in right now. We just had Rosh Chodesh Cheshvan. And he was on his way to the rabbi to ask him to write down the daily prayers that would be needed not just for the next week, but knowing that because of the rain, the roads might be muddy and impassable. He wanted the rabbi to write down for the next month, just in case he wouldn't be able to get back to Jerusalem. But the roads weren't wet or muddy at all because it didn't rain and it wasn't a problem for him to come into town. And when he came into Jerusalem, he was amazed to see that the market was closed. And not only was the market closed, but all of the Jewish stores were closed. And he actually couldn't find anybody in the streets. And he thought to himself, Oy vey, what did I do? Did I just come into town on Shabbos? Did I get the times mixed up? Did I get the days mixed up? He was really upset. But then he saw somebody walking with his talus and tefillin. And he knew that it wasn't Shabbos if somebody's wearing tefillin. So he was relieved. At least he didn't drive on Shabbos. But he didn't understand what was going on. Where was everybody? And then he finally saw somebody walking by and he said to him, Hey, where is everyone? How come all the stores in the market are closed? And the guy says, What, you don't know? Today is a fast day. It's a public fast day. And the farmer, he didn't understand this. How could today be a fast day? 
The rabbi had written down for him for an entire month everything that he needed to know, and he didn't write down anything about a fast day. And of course he had eaten breakfast already, and he drank water on the ride into Jerusalem, and he knew that there were special prayers to be said on a fast day, and he didn't know what they were, but he didn't say them, and he was very upset. And so he left his donkey and his wagon in the marketplace and ran off to the house of the rabbi. And he bangs on the door and says, Rabbi, Rabbi, I don't understand what's going on here. But the rabbi's wife was there and she said, The rabbi is not here, my son. The farmer said, Where's the rabbi? She said, He's in shul with everyone else. They're all davening because it's a fast day. Ah, uh, the farmer was really upset. He says, Thank you. And he runs off to the shul. And when he gets there, he goes straight over to the rabbi. And he's crying and he says, Rabbi, tell me, do you think this is fair? How can you do something like this to me? And the rabbi said, what's wrong, my son? Why are you so upset? And the farmer says, what do you mean, what's wrong, my son? What do you mean, what's the matter? Today is a public fast day. Everybody's fasting. And I ate breakfast. And I drank water on the way into Jerusalem. And I know that there's special prayers that are supposed to be said today. And I didn't say them. And I'm so upset because it's so important for me, rabbi. I come to you all the time so that you'll help me. And you didn't help me. How can you not tell me this? And the rabbi says, calm down. Calm down. Everything's okay. And the farmer says, what do you mean it's okay? How can it be okay? The rabbi said, today is not a regular fast day. It's not a day in the calendar. And the farmer's confused. He said, I don't understand. It's not a regular fast day, so why is everybody fasting? And the rabbi says to him, you remember when you came to me last week and you asked me to write down all the prayers for the next month because you were worried that the roads would be muddy and you wouldn't be able to get into town? The farmer says, yes, of course. He said, and when you came into town today, were the roads muddy? He said, no, miraculously, everything was dry. He said, well, you see, it's supposed to rain in Cheshvan and it hasn't rained for us yet. And since we all live off the rain and the water that fills up the wells, we're worried that there's going to be a drought. And since so much time has passed, I decreed a fast day for the whole Jewish community here. And everyone in Jerusalem is fasting. But anyone that lives outside of Jerusalem doesn't need to fast. The farmer was relieved. And then he said to the rabbi, But rabbi, I don't understand. You mean to tell me that because there's no rain, everyone is fasting and saying special prayers? And the rabbi says, Yes, what else are we supposed to do? And the farmer says, Well, I'll tell you what I do. When I don't get enough rain on my fields back home, I simply go out into the field and I say, Ribbono Shalom, Hashem, Master of the Universe, I need rain. And then it starts to rain. And the rabbi looks at the simple farmer and he says, And it works for you? The farmer says, Yes, of course, every time. I simply walk into the field and I say, Hashem, I need rain. And it rains. So the rabbi says, Okay, well, maybe it'll work for us too. Do you mind asking Hashem for it to rain? And so the farmer says, sure. And the farmer and the rabbi go into the courtyard of the synagogue. And the farmer raises his hands to the heavens. And he says, with tears and such sincerity, Hashem, Father, my Father, our Father, the Father of all the Jewish people, the Father of the whole world, Father, how is it possible that your children in the holy city would die because you didn't send them water? Can't you see, Hashem, that they need rain? Just like you give me rain in my fields, Hashem. Whenever I ask you, Hashem, I'm asking you to give the Jews of Jerusalem rain. And just like that, it started to rain. And the fast was over. And everyone rejoiced with the simple farmer dancing in the rain in the courtyard. And then the Rebbe Maharash, Rabbi Shmuel of Lubavitch, he turns to the Chassid who was visiting from the Holy Land. And he says, so tell me, my sweetest friend, do you really think you know who's a holy person in the land of Israel and who's not? He said, you never know. You never know. You have to treat every Jew as if they might be the greatest rabbi. Because the truth is, you never know. And may we learn from the sweet simplicity of this simple, unsophisticated Jew that let me tell you, my sweetest friends, this is how you daven. You speak to Hashem and you say, Hashem, I need rain. And if you truly have faith, the rain will come. And until it comes, our job is to hold on and be basimcha and be joyous always. So may we merit to be like the simple farmer 
and serve Hashem with such beautiful, pure, and simple faith. In the shul that I daven in, which is a Chabad shul, at the end of Simchat Torah, and also the Shabbos after, and even the Shabbos after that, the rabbi, Rav Segel, is one of the old Chabad Hasidim in the holy city of Jerusalem. He says at the end of davening, V'yakov halach ledarko, and Yaakov went on his way. And this is a tradition in Chabad, that after the holidays of Tishrei, and especially on the Shabbat of Bereshit, the Rebbe would always say in a loud voice, V'yakov halach ladarko, and Yaakov went on his way. And the meaning, of course, is to carry the holidays with you because we have these holidays and everything's so joyous. We're dancing and singing and davening. And all of a sudden it ends and you have to get back to work and regular problems and come back into this world. And so I want to share with you a short story from Reb Mendel Futterfuss. Now, Reb Mendel is famous for being in the Gulag, in the Soviet prison where very few people ever came out of. And he was there for many years. And one of the reasons that he survived being in the Gulag was because he was joyous. He said when he was there in Siberia, whichever mitzvot he was able to keep, he said he didn't take credit for them. Because Hashem told us to put on tefillin, to keep Shabbos and keep kosher. So those he did to the best of his ability. But there's one thing that he did take credit for. He didn't allow the prison authorities to make him sad and depressed. And after a short time in prison, he noticed something. Anyone who showed the slightest sign of breaking under the pressure of being in prison and losing their status and their wealth and authority and whatever they had, so the guards did everything they could to break that person completely. But for somebody like Reb Mendel, who maintained a positive attitude and was happy all the time, the guards didn't know what to do with him, and so they left him alone. They realized that their regular tactics were not going to affect those people, so they figured why waste their time. And this is the reason that it's a mitzvah to be joyous and Sukkot and Shemini Yatzeret and Simchat Torah, but especially after the holidays are over. Because if a person focuses on the bad in themselves, then they're not going to be happy. And the evil inclination, the Yetzirah, will constantly remind them of what they've done wrong. And that'll cause the person to be sad and depressed. And then they'll just give up and say, I'll never truly succeed. When a person is happy to be a Jew and takes pride in being connected to Torah and mitzvot, then that creates a joy that sustains us through the whole year. And that's what we can learn from Reb Mendel. No matter how much you feel like your life is hard or you're suffering, it's probably not as hard as being in the gulag in the Soviet Union. And if Reb Mendel could remain joyous, then he teaches us that so can we. May we be blessed to be joyous always. So since I'm mentioning Reb Mendel, I figure I'll add one more short story. There's so many stories of Reb Mendel from when he was in the gulag. So one of the things that was prohibited was playing cards. It was a serious crime, and if somebody was caught, the punishment was very severe. But somehow, the inmates always managed to have a deck of cards. And when they had free time, they would play cards, even though it was forbidden. Eventually, somebody told the guards about the cards in the prisoners' quarters. And so the guards came in, they found nothing. Several weeks went by, and everyone's still playing cards. And every time the guards would come in, they couldn't understand. How can these prisoners, who are thieves, be smarter than us guards? And finally, they decided that they were going to finish this with the cards. They were going to search every single centimeter of the barracks, and they were going to check everyone's bodies and clothes. And they spent hours going through everything. And they found nothing. And they came to the conclusion that the person who had told them, the informer, that there were cards in the prisoners' barracks was simply lying to them or making fun of them. But as soon as the guards left, the cards appeared and the prisoners started playing cards as usual. And Reb Mendel, he didn't understand how this could happen. 
because the guards checked every possible place to hide anything. But eventually, the thieves told Reb Mendel their secret. The head thief, he said, you see, we're professional pickpocketers. As soon as the guards come into the barracks, we slip the cards into one of their pockets. And right before they leave, we pull them out again. And the guards never thought to check their own pockets. So for Reb Mendel, every lesson that he learned in the Gulag was a lesson for serving Hashem. And he said, you want to understand what's really going on around you? Start by checking your own pockets. How many times do we blame somebody else? Who's responsible? Oh, my therapist told me that my parents are responsible. Or my wife is responsible. Or I had a bad education. Or I just had bad circumstances. And everybody can be blamed except for yourself. Because that's the easy and less painful way to do things. But in the end, it doesn't pay. In order to really put your life in order, you have to look in your own pockets and see what's hidden there. We be married to do tshuva, my friends. Only basimcha, only with joy and with such love for Hashem. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening. As always, my sweetest friends, make sure to share this podcast with anybody who you think might be interested. I'm so grateful really to all the listeners because the numbers on the podcast keep going up every week. More and more people are listening. More and more people are subscribing. And that's really thanks to you because you're sharing this and telling people about it. And if you're listening on YouTube, make sure to leave me a comment. And if you're not listening on YouTube, you can send me a message on Facebook. Or you can send me an email. My email is really simple. It's my name at gmail.com. I'd love to hear from you. And if you feel like giving a little extra and helping out with a financial contribution to the podcast, you can find that on my website, HasidicStory.com, H-A-S-I-D-I-C Story.com. Thank you for listening. Have a wonderful Shabbos. And I look forward to our next story together.